that's not a problem at all. Um, and thanks for warning. <laughs> what I would like to do is to encourage you to be, to participate, to think. That probably will be the most valuable thing for us today. And I would like to make it interactive. So when I ask questions, we have a chat window. So please feel free to, to post your answers in there. I have it open here as well. And um, I will try to pick some of the answers. Or if you don't want to, just, just, just try to think and sort of digest it on the inside. And we can take you on a little bit later. But without further ado, let's just dive in. The only thing I would like to mention is that psychology is fascinating and very interesting. I'm sure Emma, you would agree and you probably are the most qualified person in the room. However, today, talking about imposter syndrome, I would like to make it very relevant on a general level, but also on a technical level for women in tech. So to see why, why we are holding back and what are those little wins that we could nurture in order to grow our confidence in the tech area. Here we go. First of all, I would like to start by just also showing you a very short video. It's just going to be 30 seconds, but just listen to it for a moment. We can't hear the sound. Is that deliberate? No. Uh, I think under like the sharing screen options at the top, you can also click to share audio under the Zoom settings. So I think it's at the top bar. Share sound. Yeah. Sound the best, wouldn't it? There we go. Now we can hear it. I just want to stop there. Uh, can you see how big and wonderful, magnificent orchestra is that? And there is a, a choir at the back. And this piece of music is fantastic. It's classic, it's timeless. And it's almost like a human superpower to produce something so beautiful and emotional. However, it's also a human superpower um, to have this ability to convince ourselves that something is true when it's completely not. And there is a scary statistic that 75% of us have convinced ourselves that we are an imposter or fraud, or we are not good enough. Statistically speaking, some people in this orchestra who are playing such a beautiful music, actually day to day, wouldn't be feeling as confident thinking, oh, that violinist is much better than I, than I am. I'm just, just lost in here, what am I doing? And, and it's very scary because their success is evident. When we're at work, when we are you know, uh, delivering something, we've probably come across as hardworking, talented, great individuals. However, on the inside is this feeling that, oh, I shouldn't be here or it's just, oh, it, 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 it was luck, I was at the right place at the right time and so on. So today we are going to talk about the imposter syndrome and, and how it works. So it's this nasty feeling, right? So we're questioning ourselves. And the point is that we are scared because we think that at some stage, somebody gonna find out that we are effectively a fraud or we shouldn't be here. And can I just point out that it, it's a different scale, right? It, it's very likely that you're not just sitting there and thinking, oh, this is it, I'm nothing. No, of course not. In some extreme cases, somebody might do, but it also might be just a sneaky feeling at, you know, in the morning when you turn up at work and you have a meeting with your team discussing different strategies, or you just 
did a great presentation and somebody will say, oh, that was fantastic. That was so useful. But you just say, yeah, thank you. So kind of, you almost feel uncomfortable accepting praise, which, which shouldn't be because you just did fantastic work. And, and quite often when I was talking to people, what it does to you is that, let's say we are working on some data analysis or some piece of code and it just doesn't work. It's just one of those days when it just doesn't work. And it's the sinking feeling that, oh, I, I, can't, I can't do it. I, I can't hit the deadline or I need to ask for help from my team. And because I'm asking, they're gonna think that, well, I don't quite know this. I'm gonna think, well, how did you get an interview? How did you even end up here? And then it even sort of scales up on a huge, you know, in, in, in a huge proportion thinking, oh, and, and then I'm gonna have my three months uh, probation interview. And they would say that I'm not just quite there, not hitting the mark. I'm gonna lose the job. and and I'm going to be on the job market again. It sometimes just scales up. And it, it really shouldn't be. Even if it doesn't scale up, this feeling that somebody is much better, that we, we are not in the right place, or we shouldn't even try, is harmful. It really, really is harmful. And, and, the important thing is to realize you are not there alone. Quite 75%, 75% of people are actually suffering from that. And interestingly, so while 70 to 75% of people are suffering from imposter syndrome, it's been proven in recent studies that women actually suffer from this syndrome even at a higher rate than men, especially when it comes to male dominating environments. And here is an example. So when applying for a job, a man would apply for a job when he meets about 60-ish percent of the requirements and the criteria. A woman would apply for a job when we meet about 95 to 100 percent of a criteria. That is absolutely crazy. And it's not because men are lying, but because they have more confidence, because because you don't have to be 95 to 100%. I can imagine what sort of feelings are going through one's head, thinking, oh, um, you know what? If I just say tick, tick, tick to every single tech requirement and every single non-tech requirement, it will be almost like embellishing my CV. And when I actually end up there, I wouldn't be able to prove 100% that I know every single piece of technology. And I actually would like to address it straight away. As developers, as uh, data analysts, let's just have a look at a job example, right? I look through about 10 or 20 and put together most common requirements. Somebody wants us to know, let's say Python and Perl, Scala, whatever, JavaScript, you know, some kind of development language, as well as uh, a little bit of um, front-end development, UIs, and some, you know, loads of different databases, etc. And I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this requirements and thinking, oh, Python, okay, I know Python really well. JavaScript, heard about it a little bit, know some, not really. I know Angular, but I don't know React. And I only know MySQL. Do I go for the job? Yes. The answer is yes, you do. And here is the ingredient. This is something that was passed down to me from my mentor and from my uh, supervisor when I was at universities years back, and I think it's still, still very accurate. As a technologist, you need to have three core things. Know one language really well, know your database, and I personally add for myself, know your APIs. And the reason is that you develop using a language. Your data is flying, floating to and from some kind of database, so you need to keep it there. And your APIs will be delivering it backwards and forwards. Knowing one language well would enable you to, you know, you know all the concepts. So it would enable you to learn another language very easily. Here's a practical example. I was once going for an interview and I didn't know Perl. It was one of the requirements. Okay, and I and I very honestly said, I, I don't know Perl, but I'm I'm happy to, I'm happy to pick it up. You know what the key question was 
And I also noticed it was in one other interviews that I had, you know, years later. The, the interviewer actually wanted to know, not that I don't know Pearl, for example, but how am I going to learn it? What am I going to do to pick it up quickly? They said, oh, you know, we have loads of um, legacy scripts that are written in Pearl and nobody uses Pearl anymore. In my opinion, it's all oh, really sort of dinosaur-like language. And they said, well, you, we need you to pick it up because we need you to rebuild it in, in, in Python. And I said, well, I will look up some courses and here is the secret. To pick up a language, all you want to focus on, and you can do it even before your interview or a little bit of a practice, two things. I want to know how to run it. So how to set it up and how to run it, how to execute it. And I want to know how to debug it because I want to put my little breaks in the script, maybe use the print function, maybe just output, because if I'm given a script or some kind of application, all I want to do is just to be able to run it little pieces one at a time and see what they do. That's it. Syntax, you always can look it up. You can always look it up. That's not a problem. If you have that sort of, you know, up your sleeve that I know how to run it, I know how to debug it, it will come to you. And with time, it will be your second nature. If you know React or Angular, they have very similar, uh, very similar sort of technologies. So you can go and very honestly say, okay, I had a project in React. Um, we worked together with the team. I wasn't driving it, but I developed some features. So I'm quite comfortable picking up Angular because I think that will be uh, quite similar and in fact, interesting to learn. And databases, as long as you know one, don't be scared because let's say in this particular advert, Mongo is even non-relational DB. But remember that the advert was put by a recruiter, not by specifically um, a hiring manager in many, many cases. So of course the company might have loads of databases. They might just, you know, store their logs there or something else. As long as you're familiar with the concept and you're honest about it, and the best honesty is to show your capability and ability to pick up a new language and explain how you're going to do this. This is what will get to your job. So as long as you know one language really well, a database really well, you know your APIs, please don't be scared to apply for jobs. If you've never seen or touched or felt front, front end, because of front end systems, uh, HTML, et cetera, perhaps do a quick course. That's not difficult, it's, it's more about sort of familiarizing yourself with what it is because it's different to, 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 let's say, Python or Java. And as long as you know what it is, go for it and say, okay, I just did a course. I did um, a CFG's uh, front end. I, I have, have the flavor of it. I'm happy to pick it up and this is how I'm going to do it. So don't be scared. Men have this confidence and we need to nurture it and we need to grow with it. So how in the working environment and in general, we recognize the person who have this imposter syndrome, right? So we've said that it's the feeling of inadequacy that exists despite your evident success. And it might be on a different scale. It might be kind of just a sneaky little feeling. It might be overwhelming, almost depression-like. A person would feel like a fraud. A person is afraid of being discovered. A person has difficulty accepting praise and success. And, you know, if, if you ever, ever experienced even a fraction of these feelings, maybe this is something that you have. And that's okay, because many people have it. The key is to recognize it and then manage it. Not cure it completely. It's very difficult. It's an ongoing pro uh, process, but to recognize it and manage it and make yourself feel better and share it with someone else. Here, I would like you to use your chat window, please. Let's do a quick quiz. So based on, on everything that I've just said, which of this is not, not a sign of imposter syndrome? So A, afraid of being outed as a fraud, B, feeling unworthy of success, uh, C, blaming accomplishment for luck, or D, dismissing positive feedback. So which is not? And uh, Tony, I can see you already posted something, just, just whack your answer in. 
don't be afraid. Yeah, yeah, Amina with a question mark. Tina, okay, very good, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm keep looking left because as a good old trader, I have loads of screens set up, so I have loads of notes and so on. Okay, I see loads of um, loads of answers. And the truth is, the answer is they all are. They all are. Those of you who said they all are, great, well done. Some of who actually went, oh, maybe A, maybe C. I don't know. So psychologists say that one of the coping strategies of somebody who might have uh, imposter syndrome is inability to speak up or challenge. Even if everything's like, oh, hold on a minute, but they all are fine. In a meeting, right? Somebody's pushing their agenda or talks about um, a particular implementation of the system. And you just think, hold on, but but uh, we cannot do this because uh, A, B, C, but then, you know what? M maybe I'm wrong, or maybe maybe I just don't know something. I just I just I just I just hold back. I just hold back. And it's 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 something that we need to work on. I've been there myself, thinking like, mm, you know what? I I I just I just mention it to them after the meeting. D don't worry. But um. It's good to speak up. It's good to actually raise the hand and say, oh, uh, what if this or my understanding is that? Um, it's, it's good to have a conversation. It will be appreciated by your colleagues, by your team members, whoever else. So the strategies of inability to speak up or challenge, being overly nicey sometimes, and talking about the nicey, have you ever thought how we come across at work at times? There are two, um, two email examples. I'm gonna read you the first one. If you have a moment, would it be possible please to test the code changes that are promoted to UAT last week? I would be grateful if you could test and provide your sign off by Thursday before noon. No worries, no worries if not, no worries if not. I was just hoping to release this change to broad this week. So this is the letter from let's say developer who is asking a business or being panelist or user to test some changes before it goes to production. And it's the language, the language is so tentative as if we are, I don't know, trying to borrow money from them or something. And um, it's okay, it's okay to be assertive, polite and assertive and ask for certain things to happen. So if you would say, hey, have you had a chance to test the code? I promoted it to UAT last week. I need you to do it by Thursday because we plan it. We scheduled the release for Friday. I mean, let me know if not, or uh, subject to successful testing, but it's okay to be more assertive. And I think how, how to work on this, there is no cure, but once we've written our email, Maybe we need to take a little pause, make a cup of, cup of tea, come back and reread it. Just reread it back and, and maybe edit it a little bit. Maybe just, just spend five minutes, refine your wording and send it. Because it's good to come across as assertive. It's good to come across as a person who gets things done. And you'll have more respect from your team. And it's okay. It's okay not to please everyone. It's absolutely fine. Um, next one, and this is the, and this is the, it's so close to my heart. That's why I guess I took a pause to, to focus on this. When somebody, I'm gonna say suffers from imposter syndrome, and let's say it's not even on the large scale, but just the sneaky feeling. Unfortunately, we begin to downplay our success or dilute, we begin to dilute. And that's a dangerous thing because you might be in a work environment and they're intelligent people and you think like, well, okay, I, I have a degree or I've done a course uh, or I self-taught, but everybody, everybody here did a course. So everybody here did you know, have a degree. So, so it, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not particularly standing out or think, oh, I can speak a foreign language. But gosh, there's so many people who can speak like multiple languages. They moved countries. 
some people are bilingual, so it's, it's okay. You know, it doesn't matter that I've been learning it for such a long time since I was at school, etc. My accent, you know, but I'll I'll try to you know refine myself and I try to speak better. Or you think, oh, um, uh, Pete here at work, he's staying really late at work and works every day, every evening, trying to work in the stores. Uh, and I, and I have to go because I have children, I have husband, I have boyfriend. Oh, I just have class and I feel like really bad. I feel like I seem inefficient. But the thing is, you are different. You are different. And we should never, ever, ever dilute who we are. Psychologists say that the only common thing between all the human beings, being is that we all are unique. And that's your uniqueness your own story, your own upbringing, your background, what you know, who you know, the languages that you speak, the languages that you can program in, the countries that you moved, your family, everything about you is unique. And it doesn't matter who that somebody has a degree to. You are there, you're delivering things, you're working, you're fantastic. And that's what we need to remember. So if you ever, 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 feel that you begin to dilute who you are, stop. Just, you have to put bra brakes on that and say, no, I am actually unique. We all are, and we all have different circumstances. So I'm going to actually stop sharing for a minute because I just want to talk. Um, we'll come back. Um, I'll, I'll come back to our lovely slide deck in a moment. So where does imposter syndrome even come from? Psychologists try to do loads of research and studies and try to um, sort of build different correlations. And there was no any sort of concrete conclusions because our brain is a very complicated thing and loads of different factors might affect how we feel and therefore may or may not imposter syndrome. Some scientists, they looked at um, family upbringing, saying that in your childhood and how you were raised, perhaps you were in a family where if you do something great and really well, you got loads of praise. And maybe when you failed, you got bad marks at school, you got loads of critique. And that is hurtful, especially as a child. But the truth is there is no that much correlation. So it's not evidence-based. However, the one thing that everybody agreed on is that is the multiple things that affect us. It's our, it's our environment, our family, our friends, our work, our social status, absolutely everything. There is no one single thing that's quite common to end up, uh, you know, having that self-doubt. The key thing is to <coughs> recognize it, as we mentioned already, and manage it. And the first advice would be talk about it. Talk to someone in a safe environment. Talk to your friend, your other half, your family member, if you can, if you can, because sharing, sharing helps a little bit to ease that sort of pressure on your chest, this horrible bracket, you know, or this cold sort of um, feeling that is going down your spine sometimes when you're really, really stressed. Try to share it. Or let's say if you don't have maybe somebody you could share it with within your immediate um, family or a friend, a friendship circle. Maybe you have great you know, colleagues or friends who you met at one of the CFG courses or anywhere else and who is in a similar environment and just, just talk how you feel, um, how they feel. Maybe start up a new initiative, you know, get together for a cup of tea or coffee um, and, and discuss it. However, I made that point before and uh, one girl said actually, but you know what, um, if, I am talk, if I'm kind of talking to someone about how fat I feel, I'm not gonna feel, uh, and I'm gonna become any thinner, right? And I thought, oh, that's actually a really good point. However, A, talking, talking helps, but you cannot talk your way out of imposter syndrome. You just can't, you, you need to act. We need to manage it. Talking is the first step. Um, so there is no magic ingredient that can cure us. 
but the things that we can do, first of all, or shall I say second of all, because the first one was cooking, recognize people who don't really have imposter syndrome. Just, just, just put them around yourself. You know, there are people, there are people who do not have imposter syndrome. And it doesn't mean at all that they are more intelligent than us or they are more capable than us. It just means that they think differently. And it's great news because all we need to do, we need to learn how to think differently. And please believe me, nobody, absolutely nobody likes experiencing failure or make mistakes or not know the answer or have, have a bad day at work or struggle to master something. However, when it happens to imposters, and I, sh I, I would include myself, I would, I would admit I, have, I, I do experience that. When it happens to us, we feel shame. A non-imposter wouldn't feel shame. A non-imposter would feel it's okay not to know the answer. It's okay to have a bad day today. But for us, it's this, you know, physical feeling of difficulty to breathe, maybe, and, and just shame, just shame. So here is an example. A one lady at work said, I was in a meeting with my team and all her, all her team members are, are, are men actually. And she said, I feel like an imposter. I feel like I really, I just feel really awkward because they are very articulate. And when we discuss different strategies, so how we should implement something, I'm just not on the same level. So, so I, you know, I just feel really awful and they probably think that I don't know much, they just take me for granted. Um, and I could have said, I could have said to her, oh, I'm sure you're very articulate. I'm sure you are. But it, it wouldn't serve her well. And the reason is because she's thinking, she was thinking like an imposter. So instead, I actually said to her, mm, maybe that day you weren't particularly articulate, but, but it's fine. You, you are great at ABC. So, so my strategy was to acknowledge, acknowledge that maybe that day her articulation wasn't, you know, 100%, but that's okay because she's a wonderful human being and a wonderful individual. And this is what we need to do. We need to try to sort of reframe our thinking and and try to kind of encourage ourselves to learn to learn to think in a non-imposter way here is another another example actually fr from work um somebody was asked to put um a presentation at a very short notice like at 11th hour and i know that person spent loads of time and effort and sleepless night doing it and next day they delivered it and it was fantastic but the key thing it was really really useful for for others it really really was and when when you know some team members and audience came up to her and said oh that was really great that, that was fantastic you're like mm, yeah, yeah it's, it's fine that's fine and it's 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 the paradox it's the contradictory nature of the impossible syndrome because imposter thinks like oh my god people people just are so gullible sometimes they they are not even realizing that i'm a fraud and when you come to someone to say you know what that was great i find it so useful and they say to you oh that's nothing well first of all it almost sounds even arrogant you think like oh okay okay you think it was nothing i thought it was amazing and brilliant um so this is you know something that imposter syndrome does to some of us and we basically shoot ourselves in the in the foot and people quite always I, i'm mentoring a few 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 people at work and people quite always quite often ask but, but what else can i do what else can i do and i thought well, we've just discussed so many things that we could do where we can start and i think i realized that the reason some people are asking what else can we do even if even if you just given 10 sort of tips, useful tips where to start, is that sometimes we want to walk into the room as an imposter and walk out of the room without the imposter syndrome. But this is not possible because this is not how it works. Because it's the feeling and the feeling is the last to change. To change the feeling, we need to first of all, change the way we think and we need to manage ourselves and help ourselves to 
to sort of set our mind to see opportunities, to see good things in failures, for example, and to realize that it's okay not to be perfect. Um, example of reframing, I, I, I mentioned that word a few times. Um, actually, it was from one of the articles I read and I thought it was quite a good example. There was a group of hikers who got lost in the woods um, two or three days. So quite, quite a nasty experience, I can imagine. And when they were being interviewed for um, a local newspaper magazine, they actually said, well, we were not lost, we were bewildered for three days. And I thought that is beautiful. So they were bewildered for three days. And that's the way to turn the situation. And I'm sure they had loads of, you know, apart from spending a few nights in, in the woods, but they had some experiences, some memories that they shared, and there might be some silver lining in, 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 in any situation. So it, it, it will be great to feel confident 24 seven, but we can't. And another interesting fact is that our body on the chemical level, it doesn't know the difference between fear and excitement. So when you feel fear or excitement, it's the, the same thing is happening here inside our chest. So when you are in a situation where a confidence is a bit flaky, delivering a presentation, going for a job interview, whatever else it might be. Just tell yourself, I am excited. Yes, I am excited. I'm not scared, I'm excited. And you might not even believe it in your head, but you know that to act confident, you don't necessarily have to be confident. So, so with time, with time, if you keep working on that, you will believe it. And you will use that technique of reframing your thoughts much faster so you wouldn't even need to you know combat or battle this imposter syndrome and you will believe in your head that you're excited that you're okay and it will be wonderful so let's look at practical things what we can do first of all let's address the failure and let me bring my uh, presentation back uh, to share my screen here you go. So dealing, dealing with the failure. <coughs> May I please ask you guys to either you have a computer screen or use your phone. Um, I'm going to ask you a question and it will be great if we together build some sort of, you know, cloud, uh, a word cloud as our collaboration sort of contribution of our own feelings and thoughts. Dealing with a failure. Think about a moment in life when, when, when things went just so badly and wrong that, that you couldn't even hide it from other people and, and others knew it and it was a terrible, terrible feeling. Maybe you've been studying for the exam and, and you failed. Maybe you've gone for a job interview, it didn't go well. Maybe you did a mistake at work and it you know, blew up things and you go to blame. A friendship that went sour, a relationship. Just, just think about something that felt so awful. It doesn't have to be technical, just personal. And, and if, um, if you now open on your phone or... or or you know, a new tab on your computer <clears throat> uh, and go to this website, www.menti.com and type in that code, you will have options to enter three words or three phrases or whatever else. You can do one, you can do two, it doesn't matter. So question is, it's absolutely anonymous by the way. The question is, when you had that feeling of failure or how horrible it was. What did you feel? What did you feel? You can put anything. It could be sadness. It could be um, burning feeling in my chest. Uh, it could be despair. It could be wh whatever it is. I, um, I might do that as well, just to participate together. Uh, you know, what was it? How, how did you feel? 
what was going through your mind. Just, you know, hold on to that feeling. So we have loads of interesting answers. Uh, the bigger the word, the more common it is. It means that people entered it, you know, a few times. Hot, sad, sick, shame. Yes, I can, you know, as, as many of us can probably relate to, to loads of those loads of those feelings and it's terrible it's strangling it's absolutely strangling and sometimes we don't even share it we we just we just live with it we go to bed with it we wake up with it so I, I, i'm going to keep it there and we will come back to our work cloud but it's very interesting thank you so much thank you so much for sharing it because it's hard sometimes to share something like this so dealing with the failure right in our life, from very young age, directly or indirectly, consciously or subconsciously, we're influenced by popular culture, by society, which tells us we should be getting better and better and better, which suggests that our life should be an exponential success curve, right? From, from the very young age, we should just grow and go up. Examples would be if we start from kind of from, from the bottom here, intelligence. Okay, you 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 begin school and nursery and then school, and you know, you have to study more and more, you need to get good exams and good marks. And then oh, when you're grown, you, you need to be a popular kid or you need to be hang out with popular kids, kids. Um, you know, you need to make more friends more and more and hang, you know, play team sports with them, go out. Um uh, beauty, we, we, we need to grow up, we need to be beautiful. If you don't have it naturally, work on this. Go to gym, uh, you know, shape yourself up, do hair extensions, buy a certain dress, then, then study at university, um, get a great job, you know, earn more and more money. So, so it, it's loads of expectations and it's loads of pressure, isn't it? But the life is not perfect script. And we don't really have a culture that helps us to know how to deal with our emotions or situations when we fail of the exponential curve. You know, that it doesn't work quite, you know, upright for us. But what if we don't even start on that exponential curve? So we don't have the culture that teaches us how to deal with failure. And, and I would encourage you, and I would always say that we need to we need to question this delusional mentality because that life doesn't work like this. And there are some examples on the screen, you know, of successes and things that make us like, oh, I'm not quite like that. But very, very, very few people are falling into these categories of fairy tale. In fact, hardly any. And remember when ha what happens to us when we actually you know, fail, how we feel, that, that's what we feel. This is our word cloud. We embarrass, we expose the shame. We are not quite on that curve. And we, we try to grow, but we fail. And then we stay down. And it's the feeling of shock and hurt, embarrassment, shame. We feel like we're never gonna get up. It's too pain, painful, it's too difficult even, even to move on. How it should work, however, is that we stay down and it would not, not, never go anywhere. I mean, it, it hurts, it hurts, it's a feeling. I cannot tell you not to have a headache if you have a headache or stop having tummy cramps if you have tummy cramps. But we need to return. And whenever you experience failure before, maybe time helped. Maybe people around you helped. We need to crawl back very slowly and return to the level where we were. But we don't take any risks yet. We just need to get back on that level where we were. But once we're on that level, then we think, okay, I, I, I actually, I can learn from this experience. Yeah, I'm going to keep learning. Now I'm going to grow. I'm going to start again and I'm going to do it. 
and I'm going to do it even better. So we fall, but we need to come back. And the danger of staying down, if you're not returning, if you're not growing, is this unconscious vows that prevent you from embarking on new opportunities and new challenges. It might cause a long-term damage by cutting off some friends or opportunities or whatever else it might be. And staying down makes us afraid of failure even more, makes us feel like an imposter, but you are not because it's okay. It's okay. In fact, this is what the learning cycle look like. Uh, we, we try, we might or may not fail. If we fail, we learn and we grow and we try again and it repeats and repeats. And here's a very good example. So cancer, right? We as a human beings, we have not beaten cancer yet. Uh, how many doctors and researchers are there who, who you know, devote their life, write PhDs and, you know, research this awful disease, but we haven't cured it yet. Is it a failure? Are all these people failure? No, they are not. They tried. And maybe they haven't invented the cure or magic pill that will help you, you know, battle cancer, cancer. But they tried that avenue. And because they tried that avenue, others who will come after them know that they don't need to lose their time. They just need to focus on other opportunities. And that's how it works. So failure is not a bad thing. And it's absolutely normal. In fact, our learning curve in real life, without those magic, I won a competition, I met, met friends, I am super duper, looks like this. We grow, we fall, we might grow again. Very slowly but surely, we can grow up, we might fall again, I don't know. But that's ups and downs. Life is full of ups and downs, and it's absolutely fine. And now, speaking specifically about the tech area, right? So we said that on the general level, we looked at the failure and how we can cope with this. And we talked about reframing our way of thinking. We talked about sharing and speaking out loud. But now specifically, how to grow our confidence in tech as a software developer or as a data specialist, we all have different background. We might all be at different levels of our career, beginner or sort of medium or very senior. Doesn't really matter. So regardless of where you are on the tech arena, where are those little things where you can grow your confidence and you know build a stronger relationship with your friends, colleagues, the team, the network, grow yourself. Let's have a look. Uh, before I do that, I have another quiz question for you. And please, please, please do use your chat window again. So what color can the human eye see the most shades of? If you just type your answer in a chat window, it will be very interesting to see. There is one color the human eye can see the most shades of. Okay, we see different uh, green, red I've seen so far, white. Is so many, so many are coming through. So I might, might have missed a few, I'm sorry. Blue. <clears throat> okay, wonderful. So the answer is green. And the prehistoric reason for that is that because we are human beings and we evolved from dinosaurs, animals, and all the fascinating creatures, is to be able to see our environment and predators in the jungle to spot them. And that's why we can see the most shades of green more than any other color. And the key point here is that to be more confident, we need to know our environment, where we are. And talking about the technical arena, let's say we are a software developer. <clears throat> We need to understand what is our environment, and I would say what is the architecture that we work with. So here is a little map. Here is me, us. You might be working by yourself. You might be working with your team, right? We're going to map out as many things as we can. Um, a little note here, you all may be working in different companies, a really large ones, uh, medium-sized, small startups. <clears throat> 
so the setup might be a little bit different. However, even if you recognize um, a couple of those connections or sort of, you know, items on the map, maybe take a note. Um, maybe not every item would be applicable to your working environment. However, the more you know, the safer you are. This one is based, let's say, on a, um, a large bank or something like that. <coughs> where we have loads of different teams and, and how we deal with them. So even within your team, you need to, the valuable things would be to, if you're at the, at, at the beginning of your career, perhaps do some pair programming with your um, colleague who is more senior. If you need to really, really crack or design a particular feature, and that's a little bit challenging, there will be knowledge share sessions because you might have come across a very interesting library. For example, you need to build a new schema for, I don't know, um, messages that you are sending as an intelligence officer uh, backwards and forwards to your consumers. Um, and you are building it in a very conventional way. But you just learned about a library called Marshmallow and you think, oh, actually, I want to do a really quick session. It's just going to be 10, 15 minutes, but I, I'm, I'm just going to share it with you guys. It doesn't have to be a one hour sit down. So, so do this it's really, really useful. Um, and more senior colleagues might ask you sometimes about technologies or things that you came across but they haven't before. If you are working on a new um, story or um, feature, do a whiteboard session. Before you sit down coding, if it's something small one, perhaps you don't need to, but if it's a part of, um, of a larger processing system, and here is an example, when I worked, uh, at some stage I worked at a bank and we were building a system that was doing um, purchasing sort of regulatory trades for MIFID and things like that. And if you're part of that, if the whole team works on this, um, then say, oh, you know what? I want to design this feature in this way and that way. And it just have to be maybe a whiteboard, a pencil, and you draw a couple of squares and arrows that demonstrate how the data flows from one side to another. It's really useful and brings them up, up to speed. <clears throat> you do code reviews with your, with your team members. And the helpful as a tip here, if somebody sends me ever a humongous code review with loads of scripts and they're here, you go, can you read this? Because I need to push it to broad. And let's say, I don't even know what it's all about. What, useful, what, what I would find useful as a more senior developer, somebody will come to me and say, oh yeah, I've been working on this feature. It's supposed to be the, doing this, this, and that, just, just a bullet points. And um, so this is the example input, this is an example output. This is what I've done. Can you please have a look and let me know? It already sets me, sets my hand at sort of, um, in the mode, okay, I know what I'm doing because the code review is not just about every line of code where I say, oh, you know what, instead of list here, I should have done list comprehension. It's also about the logic and how it flows because I can spot potential bugs, I can spot potential sort of, you know, vulnerabilities. So think about these little things and documenting, documenting your code, um, explaining what it is. You don't need to be a even, you know, highly qualified technical person to do this, but these are very, very useful things that will um, uh, make everyone happy. Um, this is the very interesting one. <clears throat> Depends on where you are. Let's, let's work bottom to top, right? Have you ever heard about first, second, third line support? So what it is, when you're a software engineer or a developer, you are a third line, you are an engineer. First line support, it's a team that, you know, as a user, uh, somebody, accountant, customer, receptions, whatever, contact and say, my computer doesn't quite work. And they will come and address it, right? Be that, I don't know, your RAM is out of memory or whatever else, something technical that it can deal with. Line two is application support. And these are your friends and keep them as close as possible and work with them as close as possible. Because let's say you're working on a large trading system and there's loads of users. By users, I would mean traders who book trades or then accountants who take data to reconcile it, risk people, 
Um, it doesn't have to be a trading system. It might be some sort of booking system. So customers will be users like you and I booking holidays. Then you are supporting the platform. And then there will be people who, again, are responsible for, for money, for whatever else, logistics. <clears throat> Application support, this is the person who would be able to advise both sides, all types of users, how to use the system, not on the coding level, but what are the expectations? Okay, if you click this button, what's going to happen? How to get your report done? What are interesting features? And you, as an engineer, you developed it. So you need to educate the second line support so that those can help your users. And if you do it right, you saved yourself so much grief because every um, sort of ask for help comes up to you to a third line through first and second line. And if those two lines can, can manage it, uh, you are free and you can focus on your work. So advice here would be um, suggest sort of um, cross, definitely cross team communication, uh, deliver demos to your uh, second line support saying, okay, we developed a new feature. Do you guys want me to show you quickly? Or if you don't want to do a presentation, just document it and send it to them separately. Or say, if you have any questions, just ask me. I'm happy to do a screen share and show you how it works. If they uh, come to you and say, oh, this broke, this broke, and it's the same thing, educate them. Say, do you want me to run a session for you? I can probably kind of you know, show you um, a couple of features and see how you can address it. Start a common list of you know, known problems that you can work on together. Ask and challenge, say, okay, what is your expectations of this feature? How do you want it to work? Because sometimes it just might be about understanding, not necessarily a code uh, that they work on. So that's certainly communicating and helping in two ways will be a fantastic thing. Now, um, a vendor, it's if you are using um, a system that you didn't develop from scratch, but you support, but actually was developed by a third party. Sometimes as a third line, you need to go to them because it might be by default, a certain behavior that the vendor built um, and there might be a bug or they might be you know, needing some improvement. So know your relationships, know where you are. As I said, you may not even have vendor, but if you do know who to contact and how. And then we have our users. And again, depends on different environments, <clears throat> upstream and downstream. Upstream is what is feeding us and downstream where we send our information, what you know, users that are taking information from us. And it's incredibly, in, in, incredibly important to know them. I could just run a session just on this mapping and talk about, and talk about upstream and downstream. Just know that it might not necessarily be a person, if it's a trader, okay, it might be a trader. It might be another team. Um, it might be, uh, let's say we're middle office. So it might be another database where we get our that data from the database to do some calculations. It might be another team, another system that feeds to us. So just know your architecture. Where are those flows? <clears throat> um, and, and know your downstream, how users want to use your data. What do they need? Maybe um, they keep us asking for a certain feature or certain data, and it's very manual, long process for them to, to, uh, to get it. Maybe there is a need for new API end. API end it just delivers the data, right? Designed in a way that will be efficient and useful for them. Maybe there is a need for some kind of UI page. This is maybe for on the more senior level. Maybe sometimes if you work on new features, you need to collaborate them on how to test your system. And that will be also very, very useful. And sometimes it will be the matter of just preparing a very well-documented, very well-described sheet and saying, okay, this is the input when I'm doing this. This is what we are expecting. Please test and confirm that test case number one, two, three worked for you and so on. And then we have business analysts. These people know how, um, approaches should work. In my case, so I'm a contrary developer. Oh, there's so much happening out there that it's not possible to know. So we go to our business analysts and say, so how do you expect the certain swaps work? How would the system need to behave or how to process them? Or can you help me 
to test it because I don't know how to run the test. It's usually the trader file that get, gets dropped and I can't do it. So how can I mock it? What kind of data should be coming in, you know, so, so that I can create a similar one and test my feature. Business analysts are your best friends. I know who they are and just sit down with them and say, okay, can we have a session? Can we grab a coffee? Can we talk about this and that? And another useful team also will be uh, your DBA team because <clears throat> if you're in a smaller company, you're very likely to do loads of SEO yourself. But regardless, you will have a separate team because there's loads of process in your writing. It might be sometimes memory issues, sometimes the locking, sometimes whatever else. Just know your relationship. My point is know your relationships, know your environment, um, develop this, <clears throat> be, be helpful, develop this connection. And the key things are documentation. Please, if you are good at this, if you're good at this, you scored or 50% of success. <clears throat> there is an application called Confluence. Maybe you've heard about it. Maybe you have it at your work. It's like a corporate wiki page where you can create new pages and describe a certain job or certain process or certain API, how it works. And it's incredibly useful because once you've documented it, you can send that link to support to your business analyst your users and answer questions there. It's all in one place. Share your knowledge, be creative. Say, oh, we keep on having this problem. Maybe we should implement a new alert so that if we see that our memory is running out or memory is about 70%, we need to, we need to do something. If we know that um, requests of this type is coming through, we need to do something. So have this creativity. If your users are struggling to test your system, say, can I develop a new endpoint? Can I do a little UI if you're good with web development uh, where you can just drop some data and it tests it for you? Think creatively, think outside of the box. Even if you don't know how to implement it yet, it's the idea that counts. And then as a team, you can figure out how to do this. There's a very, very um, kind of, I wouldn't say simple, but illustrative example of how you can prepare documentation. So on your wiki page or something. If I say to you, okay, <clears throat> that was my case recently. Uh, for some traders, we need to update a trading strategy. And uh, you know, we need to do loads at the time. And there's loads of things need to happen within the system itself. But here is the API endpoint. Just click the button, things will happen. For the user, that's okay. For a support, a second line support person, They'd be like, oh yeah, how it works? H how does it actually work? And if I explain it verbally, we're not gonna go anywhere too far. So created, I created a very simple example, <clears throat> just a PowerPoint with a couple of blocks and cubes. And I say, okay, here is my input. It's an endpoint, it's actually a dictionary. Each item <clears throat> contains the same keys and values. I, I went with apples and oranges and some, some animals. When the strategy update happens, and the strategy updates might be, I don't know, you are changing um, futures currency to commodities, but it doesn't really matter. It's just testing, it's just documentation explaining how the system works. And I say, when you actually go behind the scenes, you process each item in turn. Each item hits a certain database and updates um, update uh, given parameters. If one of the items does, let's say, four different steps, four different databases, and one of them fail, then I'm going to roll back all the ones that have happened already for this item because I want to preserve my data integrity and I'm going to mark that update as failed. So therefore I only have two that succeeded and I'm running the post process, the extra thing for, um, for the updates that succeeded. And if I give my support team something like that, they will have fewer questions. They will be very grateful. And we can, it, you know, we can start a conversation and think about improvements because we know, we both know how the process works. If I just describe it verbally and just say, here is the endpoint, hit this button and the strategy update will happen. I think we're not going to go too far. So not afraid of talking two ways, asking for help and giving help. <laughs> and here is like almost a fable um, some of you might not, might not or may have heard, I really like it. So a wise teacher at school once wrote loads of balloons and asked each student to write their name. 
once they've done it, they all put it in a hole and toss them. There was hundreds and thousands of them. And the task was to find balloon with your name. Kids were just not able to do that. Five, 10 minutes, half an hour, just were not able to do that. And another task was to, okay, then if you can't find your name, pick any balloon and give it to a person whose name is on it. And within two minutes, everybody got their balloon. So we all are in here together and it's very helpful and efficient when we help each other, when we communicate. People get more satisfaction, happiness from giving rather than receiving. As a mom, I know that, you know, on Christmas when I give presents and my kids are happy, it's much more satisfaction and happiness. Like, yay, they're having a wonderful time. Giving presents sometimes is nicer than receiving. Working together is, is great. People like when you ask for help. It almost makes them make them a little bit like, you know, oh yeah, I'm an expert. Ask me anytime. It's great to feel helpful. Um, it, it's good to build those relationships. To, to, to summarize, um, imposter syndrome, it is common. We all, maybe not all, but majority of us might have it in, you know, to a certain extent. And the message is, it's okay. Let's just recognize and acknowledge that sometimes we might suffer uh, with feeling of sort of flaky confidence, being scared, being afraid, but it's all about <clears throat> managing it and learning to think positively and sharing it. So key things I would like you to take away today, share your feelings if you can, if you may, it will help. Learn to refrain your thinking try to think like a non-imposter because it's okay to fail. That's absolutely fine. See the opportunity. Don't be afraid of that. See it as an exciting challenge. And grow your confidence in tech. There are so many low hanging fruit that could help you not just grow your confidence, but grow professionally, make useful connections and networks and boost up your career. Just just do these little things, acts of happiness, acts of you know helpfulness, and it will definitely come back to you. And hopefully you found it really useful. I'm going to pass it back to Aileen, and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Olya. That was really, really good. I think lots of people really appreciated that. I'm just going to stop recording so that people can ask um, any Q and A's.